I want to welcome Mark Reimers. Some of you may remember him from his sold out seminar for our Center for Education earlier this year. Welcome, Mark. Great, thank you, Nicole. Great, well, thank you, everyone. Um, this will be a little different than the, the uh, um, talk a few months ago. Um, so next slide, please. So why do we care about dogmatic delusions? Well, I think many of us remember six months ago, this mixed mob of costumed performance artists and hard right activists with weapons broke into the US Capitol and attempted to disrupt the presidential vote certification. As we're speaking now, hospitals in rural areas of Missouri, Arkansas, and throughout the Deep South are overflowing with patients in distress from COVID-19. Oops, back there. <laughs> And most of those are people who had refused the vaccinations that could have prevented their illness. Many of us are quite familiar with the delusions that are encouraged by the mega churches, as seen on the top right. Uh, some of you may know that many people in the mega churches are now also embracing the QAnon delusion. Next slide, please. So the question is, can psychology or neuroscience shed any light on all of this. And the bad news is that, you know, we don't really have a scientific consensus about what's going on. The human brain is very complicated. And what we have uh, is some evidence about brain activity while people are engaged with dogmatic thinking or delusion. And I think we can shed some light, but Keep in mind that just because I'm gonna show you pretty pictures like the ones on the right of brain activity, that doesn't mean that these are uh, dogmatic established facts. We really don't know what's going on. Everybody's brain is different. That's an average profile of many people's brains. If you put 10 people in the brain scanner doing the same thing, you'll get 10 very different patterns of brain activity. Next slide, please. So roughly speaking, the outline is, I'll talk a little bit about dogmatic personality from a social science perspective. I'll try to put that into an evolutionary perspective. Why should we be dogmatic? And then I'm gonna to pivot to talking about delusions and I'm gonna be mostly focusing on sort of everyday personal delusions. And then finally coming to group delusions, the ones that really trouble us now. And then I wanna end on hopefully an uplifting note, what can we do about it? And there's something, and then we'll do Q and A. Next slide, please. So let's start by talking about dogmatic thinking or dogmatic personality. Next slide. So you, you've all known dogmatic people. They know everything, <laughs> they know, what's, you know, and they have the right opinion about everything. And they can't really be convinced very easily that to change their mind. Now, you know, it's easy to recognize a dogmatic person whom we don't like, but are there any objective indicators of dogmatic thinking that, you know, maybe we could apply more systematically? Next slide, please. So I think that there have been several studies recently and I'm gonna highlight some results of a study a few years ago by Microsoft Research, uh, Ethan Fast and Eric Horvitz who are a couple of leading researchers there. Um, they wanted to understand, you know, for the point of view of, of moder automatic moderation, when are we dealing with an inflexible dogmatic um, in, uh, set of posts? And um, they came up with a number of very specific indicators, which I think we can apply across the board. So I think most of us know that, you know, dogmatic individuals tend to use very bold and sweeping language. Um, there's a lot of use of abstract moral nouns. Uh, some of you who've studied history will know that the famous phrase of the Nazis was for the sake of a higher necessity. What does that mean? Well, it sounds great, but it's hard to know what it actually means. 
And in the modern right wing in the United States, there's a lot of talk about freedom. But there are more subtle things that um, maybe less obvious, but uh, for example, people who are dogmatic tend not to use words like I think, or I feel, or I believe, or it seems. Uh, they'll use more definitive words, uh, it's just this way, and they'll use a lot more pejoratives. I think you're probably familiar with that. Um, they'll also use an awful lot of you and they, but with very unclear references, very unclear, who are we talking about? Some very abstract you or for some very abstract they. And oddly enough, they don't seem to like history. They don't like actual facts in the past. Uh, so they tend to use fewer past tense descriptions. So those are kinds of things that, you know, we can in a, you know, using an algorithm actually use to figure out, you know, the level of dogmatism and you could use uh, yourselves. Next slide, please. Now, is it only the right wing? <laughs> Those are the people I think most of us are most upset with, but at least as far as we can objectively tell from, you know, measures of cognitive flexibility, uh, there's not a very strong correlation between political orientation and, and dogmatic thinking or its opposite, flexible thinking. And uh, we might, um, you know, hope that, you know, there would be a strong slant of this graph that maybe, um, you know, people who agree with us are more flexible and people who agree with the people we don't like are less flexible. Well, there may be a very slight trend. It seems that people who are not particularly identified with a political party or political agenda tend to be a little more flexible in their thinking. Um, it's not a huge effect, but it's, it's statistically significant and, and definitely there. What about religion? Next slide, please. So I think most of us think of religious belief as a sort of archetypal dogmatic belief. And I'd like to spend a few minutes on telling you about a study that was done by um, an atheist speaker, Sam Harris, whom many of you've heard or read. Um, and so he did some work as a neuroscientist and um, he, you know, read various statements to people uh, who were believers or atheists. Some of them were religious statements. Some of them were just matters of fact, like Lansing's the capital of Michigan. And, you know, he tried to get things that people would agree with or disagree with and th things that people would agree with because of their dogmatic belief and things that people would agree or disagree with because they're just facts. They're just well known and there's plenty of evidence. And one of the key findings is that generally speaking, it's harder work to, dis to disbelieve what someone's telling you than to just go along and believe. I think that, uh, that accords with everyday experience. But in particular, um, one area that's important is that belief seems to activate this region he's calling the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And that you see at the top right of the picture, that's the same picture I showed you a bit earlier. So that's an area right sort of behind your forehead, uh, maybe a little behind your eyes. Um, and that area in particular is an exception to the rule. That's an area that seems to be working more when people believe than when people disbelieve. And um, I'll come to an explanation of that in just a minute when we talk about evolutionary um, perspectives. Uh, but that's an area that seems to be more involved with social and identity relations than with reason. So let's, uh, next slide, please. So what happens when you challenge people? Okay, so you've got people who are believing or disbelieving, supposing you actually give them evidence. And um, again, it seems to be that the areas that, uh, you know, again, people respond differently when you challenge them about a <clears throat> political or identity belief, as opposed to challenge them about, let's say a scientific fact or geographic fact. And uh, again, the areas that tend to be more active when 
people are challenged on their political beliefs are areas that are more involved in social relations and valuing, um, you know, making judgments of value. But when people are challenged on or provided given evidence contrary to their thinking about something they're not invested in politically, quite different areas of the brain like, uh, are active. And those are the areas highlighted in green, particularly in the top left and bottom figures. Those are the areas over to the side, which are typically more involved in sort of integrating and weighing different kinds of very different uh, inputs. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So why should there be such a difference between, um, you know, evaluating sort of politically, political beliefs and sort of non-political factual beliefs? And I think that so evolution sh sheds a good light on, on this. And I, you know, I, I teach a whole <laughs> course on evolution of the human brain, uh, but I'm just going to take a couple of brief vignettes. So next slide, please. So what's different about human beings is not that we're that much smarter than apes. Uh, it's not clear that we really are that much smarter than apes, but we do cooperate on a large scale, which apes do not do. And very few other animals do with the exception of, of cast insects. Um, but the key to all of these you know, gigantic buildings is that they were organized through intangible beliefs in the pyramids through belief in the divinity of their kings, a delusion uh, that I think we would all say, um, and the, the buildings on the right through the value, you know, belief in the value of money, which may or may not be a delusion depending on your point of view about human values. But I wanted to come back to the question of those specific brain areas that enable cooperation and enable belief in these kinds of things that enable cooperation. Please, next slide. And remember I talked about that area that's very active when people are believing something that's, that's arguably a you know, political belief or that could well be a delusion. And that is, um, again, those same areas, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex um, are very correlated with personality measures, particularly those not uh, involved with group loyalty and authority. Um, so people who are, you know, um, who have expanded uh, prefront, ventromedial prefrontal cortices are more likely to you know, cooperate in organized groups. So this same area that's involved in believing in the kinds of uh, delusions or, or just political beliefs that uh, you know, help cement group loyalty uh, are the people who tend to have their brain adapted to that. And we don't really know what's the cause and effect. Are people born this way? Or do they sort of exercise that area of the brain more and then that causes it to grow? We're still, we still don't know that. So, so that's what a kind of evolutionary rationale for why we should believe or often do believe false things that help us uh, cooperate together because cooperation uh, and organized effort tends to displace people who are less organized. Now let's, uh, next slide please. So I want to turn now to um, you know, somewhat, what seems to be a somewhat different topic, which is just plain delusions. So you know, the, the political beliefs could be true or false or partly true, but let's talk now about things that are absolutely <laughs> or, or very far from true. Next slide. So you know, we often, Think about the people who, who talk about being visited by little green men as deluded. Um, and uh, they are you know, maintaining their belief. And again, this is you know, firmly maintained. That sounds like dogmatism, but it's contradicted um, by reality or by rational argument. And we mostly think of you know, people like this as perhaps crazy, but next slide, please. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on you know, the psychiatry of, of delusion, but 
it's, it's fairly common to see among delusional disorders uh, that uh, people feel paranoia, that others are, the other people are trying to harm them or they're spying on them. Uh, I think you can recognize that in a lot of the delusions, you know, they, this idea that Bill Gates is putting in microchips in the vaccine to, you know, influence you. It seems absolutely bizarre, but it's the kind of thing that we see in psychiatric patients all the time. Um, another fairly common one is narcissism that, uh, and I think you all know people like that, um, that uh, we, you know, somehow the, I have a great unrecognized talent that somehow the world is just, is just missing. Um, one key, I think, theme that helps us understand what's going on with, with ordinary people is that generally speaking, the, the feeling comes first, the feeling that some events are suspicious, that they're noteworthy and people, uh, they, people have heightened vigilance. And that is often um, related to a chemical called dopamine. And I'll say a few more words about that in a minute. But the, um, the, the delusion itself, the cognitive content, the ideas uh, that make sense of all of this heightened awareness seem to come later uh, after the, the heightened feeling. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna very briefly talk about a couple of everyday delusions, um, narcissism or uh, delusions of self of grandeur. I think most of us know several people like that. Um, you know, we, we're a, cat, a kitten and we look in the mirror and see a lion. Um, most people, you know, about 90% of people think they're above average on nearly every, <laughs> on most traits. Uh, next slide, please. Another kind of, of uh, delusion that many of us have been painfully uh, through is uh, a romantic delusion where we think that um, a particular person, a romantic, um, uh, you know, a romantic partner or someone who we want to be a romantic partner is, you know, we meet them for, we talk to them for an hour and we decide that she's my soulmate or we discover, you know, you discover, you meet somebody who seems very charming and you introduce them to all your friends and they find him charming and then he turns out to be very controlling and manipulative and they say, and everyone says he would never do that kind of thing. So that seems to be um, a, a some, you know, a, an area in which many of us have experienced delusions and an interesting thing is that the brain areas that are particularly active during that sort of first flush of romance are very strongly overlapping with areas that are activated in, in drug addicts. Um, that's another whole other discussion. Next slide, please. And then um, I'd like to end, end with a sort of everyday delusion that um, you know, many of us find uncomfortable and that is that um, you know, we're telling stories about our, our life history, about what's happened to us. And um, you may have had the experience of, you know, telling a story about a childhood event and then to, to a, you know, your friends for, for many years. And then um, maybe you meet a person who was actually there, maybe a, a school chum you haven't seen for 20 or 30 years, and they have a completely different recollection of the same event. Um, it's, it's especially hard for relatives who may be getting together after a parent has died. And it seems that um, as you are talking, you know, that we've been, scientists have investigated this to some extent, as you're, you know, sharing stories, you, you, you monitor other people's reactions, you get feedback, and those aspects of the story that sort of get people going the most, that get the most response are the ones that tend to grow in your mind, and they, they tend to figure more uh, more in the next retelling. And, you know, over several stages of retelling, you may um, end up with a very different memory. And this can be experimentally manipulated. P uh, some experimenters can misinform people about what just happened to them, tell them a story that, that on the face of it, they should know is false. Um, but uh, if you do, if, if people do that with um, monitoring their brain activity, about a quarter of people can actually be, you know, can be convinced that something that just happened to them didn't happen and something else entirely happened. 
And it's those whose, again, ventromedial prefrontal cortices are most active when they're being misinformed who are most vulnerable to that. Uh, next slide. Um, I think in the interest of time, I won't spend much time on this, but it's, we are now able to see that brain activity patterns associated with vivid memories shown on the right, mostly involve activation in an area called the precuneus, um, whereas uh, accuracy tends to involve completely different brain areas. Um, there's much more to say about that. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So I wanted to tell you a bit about, about dopamine. Um, you know, the, the story we, we hear in, in popular literature is that dopamine is sort of a pleasure signal. In fact, it's a great deal more than that. Um, and uh, the group that I was involved with uh, published a paper four years ago showing that, in fact, human beings produce a great deal more dopamine uh, than um, other primates. And it's um, sort of integrated with areas involved in again, social relations and memory and uh, habit formation. And we think that dopamine enables you to sort of fixate on something that's not immediately at hand. It's what enables you to do work, to you know, go to work in the morning, um, even though you're not gonna get you know, your paycheck till the end of the week, uh, and you're not gonna eat the food that the paycheck um, enables you to buy until, you know, until thereafter. But it's that ability to keep doing something that's not immediately rewarding that, um, dopamine, that dopamine seems to be critical for. And it seems to enable you to imagine and keep in mind uh, distant scenarios, things that are not here and present. And of course, that's almost exactly what a delusion is. Uh, and you know, some of the psychiatric problems that humans have that apes do not have they all seem to involve dopamine. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so how does this work in our society today? Next slide, please. So um, we recognize that a lot of the kind of delusions that are going around in groups are conspiracy theories. And in the last five years, there's been quite an industry invest in psychology, social psychology, investigating conspiracy theories and, the, and what kind of people um, are ripe for those. And it's generally speaking, you know, what you might expect people who are frustrated in life, who can't seem to get ahead, who seem to be uh, failing at, at many of the things that are important to them, but they can't find an obvious cause and they'd like somebody else to blame. Um, it's, there's some relation to cognitive style. So people who, are, who jump to conclusions quickly tend to be a little more right for, you know, more, more susceptible to conspiracy theories, but it's the, the bigger factor seems to be uh, frustration. Uh, next slide, please. So what you know, does a mega church or some other kind of uh, group delusion like, um, you know, the People's Church, which ended in Jonestown, uh, bring to people who are ripe for these kinds of delusions? And they bring two kinds of things uh, that are important for maintaining the delusion. First, there's a sense of community. You know, people who are isolated suddenly find that they are now accept, warmly accepted. If, if any of you have been to these mega churches, you get what the, the cult analysts call love bombed from the beginning. You know, hi, how are you? How, uh, great to see you, glad you could join us. Uh, it's hard to resist that, especially if you are, you know, feeling very, very isolated. And they also preach a constant story about threats from outside groups. Uh, and those two tend to sort of, those two facts tend to isolate people and for, um, break down their network of communication outside the group and strengthen it inside the group. And we're now seeing that QAnon is playing a role somewhat like megachurches uh, have been. And, and of course, many people are moving from megachurches to QAnon. Next slide, please. And I think that, you know, we can all identify some some general social trends that contribute. Uh, 
we have a breakdown of a consensus, uh, shared facts and trust in, in the institutions that are supposed to guide our lives and tell us what's true, including science. Um, and social media in particularly enable the rapid spread of outrageous claims. Uh, there was a study uh, of Twitter a year ago showing that just about uh, everything that proliferated very rapidly on Twitter was false. <laughs> and things that you know, people didn't pick up quickly um, tended to be, well, the, the true things tended to be not picked up very quickly. And I think it's also true that many Americans are, are deeply unhappy, but um, we don't know how to think very, you know, American culture doesn't help us think very clearly about life or about feelings or about how we, you know, how we, uh, how we relate to others. Next slide, please. So I'd like to try to suggest some ways, next slide please, that we can perhaps make a difference. Can we engage with the people who, you know, whose beliefs we can't stand or find really abhorrent, who, really, who may really be deluded? Next slide. So I'm just gonna give you sort of two approaches and then end with a, a consideration. Um, I think many of us uh, have been sort of told that the Socratic method is the best approach. Um, and uh, some folks named Peter Bogosian and Anthony Magda Bosco have sort of updated this, you know, very kind of aggressive questioning approach. Uh, to, uh, and they try to help, you know, expose the shaky foundations of people's beliefs. Um, many people find this rather aggressive. Um, uh, and I don't know of any data on how effective it is. Um, however, there are some approaches that do have data that are more effective. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's uh, an approach that's described um, in the Atlantic last fall by George Gale of the People's Action. Uh, they call it deep canvassing. And the idea is, you know, you're, you're gonna be talking with someone about politics um, and you don't want to you don't want to trigger a, an immediate negative reaction so you spend some time with them this is not not quick and easy you ask them how they're doing and you follow up on the concerns they express so it says you know you ask them how they are well doing okay except you know for you know I, I, I pay such terrible taxes well you can just ask them about what you know how, you know, what are they paying? And, um, you know, George has some, some dis distinct action steps, but the idea is that you, you get into their concerns, you say, uh, and then you sort of look at, lead into pragmatic discussions of how you might address those concerns. And often people have, you know, after they complain about taxes, they'll talk about, well, I can't pay for my son's diabetes. Oh, okay, so uh, where does that lead to? Um, so maybe what would be a practical solution that you could support to how you might be able to pay for your son's diabetes treatment? That, um, they have data, again, you should, it, it's not um, an outside evaluator, but they claim it's effective in changing minds in about 5% of cases. Well, you think 5%, that's not much, except that that's like 10 times better than just about any other approach that's been tested. There's another therapeutic approach called motivational interviewing that really requires a much deeper relationship. So I won't talk about that here, but uh, some of that's listed on, on the website that uh, Nicole will put in the, uh, in the chat soon. But I'd like to, uh, next slide, please. I'd like to just step back a bit and, and sort of ask a perspective question. Um, you know, we're expecting people to engage in reason debate all the time. And we're constantly frustrated because nobody seems to be doing that. So who has the privilege to engage in a reason debate? The people who sort of in the Western tradition who invented our kind of, of uh, democracy and our kind of, of reason were all fairly privileged people. They, they, but they met as equals. 
And if we're going to expect or hope that people, um, you know, will engage in reason, we have to, I think, work toward a, a more just world where, um, you know, people do engage as equals, where they don't have to seek favor. And this is something that Roy alluded to uh, half an hour ago. Uh, we want a more egalitarian society. Um, and so I think that that sort of ties together two of the concerns of, of humanism, that we should be concerned not only with, with reason, but also with uh, thriving um, human lives and with just human relationships. And I'm going to end there. Next slide, please. Um, and if, uh, if any of you are interested in following some of these things up, um, I'm going to recommend a Four books. Uh, the two on the left are about um, sort of the evolution of the sort of group think. The two on the right are about cults and leaving uh, and why it's so hard to leave or how it's, uh, to leave cults. And Nicole, I think you were going to put in the resources link to my article in The Humanist, which has, uh, you know, 50 more uh, sources if you're interested. Um, so thanks for your attention and I'm, I'm happy to address questions. Many atheists and humanists like to think that they are more rational, yet the anti-vax movement, for example, I think he means not necessarily the COVID anti-vaccine movement, but the previous anti-vax movement, um, actually has many people from the left non-religious community promoting uh, this uh, dogma. Um, what do you think can be done to deal with perception that this is a problem they suffer from, not a problem of our community? Well, you've, you've, I hit, you've hit a, a really good example on the head there. Um, so, and I know people like that. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that it, 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 will be a, it will be a slog. I, I mean, I don't think there's a knockdown rhetorical argument you can make. Uh, I think it, it's going to take the time and I would suggest following the, uh, the uh, kind of deep canvassing approach that uh, people's action suggests, which is, you know, what are they concerned about? And then, and then ask them, okay, now what, um, you know, what could you do? You know, what do you think, a, you know, society could do to prevent the spread of infectious diseases? How would you, you know, suggest doing that? And, and, and don't, you know, you, you have to adjust this for the person you're talking with. I mean, if you have someone who be doesn't believe that their infectious disease exists, well, you've got a, a bigger, a deeper problem. Uh, but if you've got someone who recognizes that there are infectious diseases, but let's say is telling themselves that the, the vaccine is not fully tested or fully approved, now, what would be enough testing for you? Is a million people with, you know, less than 1% uh, serious consequences a significant test? Most people don't know how seriously, um, you know, how well the COVID vaccine or any of the vaccines have been tested. And, and there are a few vaccines that are kind of really should be for emergency use only that are, that they have serious side effects. So to allow that there are, you know, some real distinctions. It's not all you know, one way. Okay. Um, so this is one of the, the more specific ones I mentioned. Are those with delusional disorder similar to those activating the PFC religious belief or rigid beliefs? Um, no. Um, so I think all of us are activating, um, you know, our, our medial prefrontal cortex when we are sort of dealing with issues of our own identity or of our loyalty to, to people we value. Um, I think that what you see with religious or in some political beliefs is that that region is active while you're believing these things precisely because saying those things is a flag of your group membership. So it's, it's, you know, it's not an area that's necessarily associated with delusions. It's an area that's evolved because human relationships are very important to us. Um, but it's been the, 
you know, what we're showing is that a lot of these uh, religious and some ex and delusional beliefs that are shared um, are, sh are, are beliefs that seem to engage that same area, which tells us that these are beliefs that are not believed for any rational reasons, but they're believed because of group membership. And if you're going to really try to wean someone off those beliefs, if you're gonna invest them, there has to be an alternative. There has to be another group that they can feel they belong to. Great. Um, this is from Anson Kennedy. Um, regarding the false claims proliferating faster than true ones on Twitter, which you mentioned, has, have there been any studies of the ways the messages were presented and differences that there, that there might be, for instance, um, if they're memes versus article links or are, are, there, are there different yeah. ways, are there studies of different ways that, that the misinformation <laughs> is disseminated? So Anson, the short answer is yes, there are studies and, but no, I don't know what they actually say. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, uh, this is another question about studies um, uh, from Renee Reif. I believe that many who fall for QAnon and other um, conspiracies uh, and then discover that they, that they have fallen for conspiracy theory and, and sort of try to work to get themselves out of it, um, that it, they're they sort of realize the scam and try to regain their lives. Um, and she's positing that there's a mental illness contribution to that process. Are there studies about this fact? And is it fair to say that people who are participating in those um, conspiracies are, are suffering from mental illnesses? Well, this is a pretty fraught question. It's of course an important one. Um, and uh, as, as far as I can see, the evidence is pretty strong that people with previous mental illnesses, um, you know, whether that's anxiety, depression, or certainly schizophrenia or delusional disorder, are much more likely to join one of these conspiracy theories. And we're talking three or four times more likely. So if you go to these meetings, uh, for whatever reason, you'll find an awful lot of people who are behaving oddly <laughs> and, and you know, they're accepted and welcomed, but perhaps tolerated. Um, but in fact, you know, the, the Mooney recruiters realized quite early on that the majority of people they were recruiting were not really suitable <laughs> for, for leadership. And they, they really, you know, were given explicit instructions to target normal people, to target people, you know, who were more or less had it together. And try to bring those in. They're much harder to get, but they they were much bigger prizes. Interesting. Um, I think we have time for uh, just one more. What is the connection between the amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and how might this connection help explain paranoid anti-government conspiracy theories? Okay. Well, that could be a whole nother talk. Um, <laughs> just two brief facts. So, human beings have a much greater connection be from a ventromedial prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. So that this part of our cortex, which is sort of more involved in, in sort of keeping our social relationships in front of us, even the ones that are not immediate, can then modulate the sort of very primitive immediate actions, impulsive actions that, we, that the amygdala would drive us to. And that's a good part of why, um, you know, if your um, you know, best friend is, is yelling at you, you don't necessarily, you know, react aggressively um, always, or you, you hit them, you are keeping in mind that this person has been a deep, you know, a source of value to you for a long time. Um, and, um, Sorry, I'm forgetting what the other point is, but I think we're out of, <laughs> out of time. Yes, now. yes, it's true. Um, well, thank you so much for, for this uh, talk. It's fascinating and so very important these days. <laughs> uh, we, uh, thank we you for giving me the opportunity and for your attention. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks very much.